What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Backpacking Podcast. It is live stream time. It's been a minute, but we're back, Jeremiah. John Kelly here, Jeremiah Stringer with me, and we are ready for an awesome night. So, Jeremiah, how are you doing, man? Dude, I'm doing great. The live stream is taking place on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so that means that I had the day off from school, which means that you were probably babysitting. Because your <laughs> your kids, <laughs> I assume, yes. had the day off from school as well. It was daddy daycare today for me, man. Daddy daycare. I was here all day with the kids. And let me tell you how hard it is to put a podcast together when you got a four and a five-year-old running in and out <laughs> all the time trying to vie for your attention. So, But it was a good time. Well, I had, think, a, had a blast with the kids today. Well, here's what I did. I have, I think I talked on here before, have been dealing with this injured shoulder and have decided it is shoulder impingement. And, uh, today I decided to try my luck and get back into the gym, play a little basketball. And so I did, but I wore shoes that uh, I've only hooped in one time before. Oh, and dude, my. if I could show you my left pinky toe right now, <laughs> it is so <laughs> disgusting. I, I feel bad about myself, but that's what I did. Edited a video, but it's a good day off. And now we're here. Well, hey, man, I'm just glad you're here, dude. It's good to have you here. Um, so we are getting ready to have a fantastic guest on, but there are a few comments that have already come out here that are cracking me up. Apparently, Jeremiah, um, you are going to do a CCR cover at 730. <laughs> oh, is that right? That, that's, that's the rumor going around right now. So I uh, didn't know if you knew that or not, but that that's happening. Um, <laughs> No, we got we got our buddy uh, Devin is here from Backcountry Exposure. Always good to have right, Devin, Devin on here. Um, but this is going to be a good show, man. We've got basically a living legend that is on the show with us today. A guy who uh, goes without any real need for introduction. But before we do that, we need to mm. give a shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, and that is Outdoor Vitals. Outdoor Vitals Live Ultralight. We've been big fans of Outdoor Vitals for a while now, and they've been sponsoring a lot of our episodes, which has been really cool. And I'm excited because this weekend, I'm taking this guy out with me, the 40th two-person tent. And yes, I said a tent. I'm going in a tent this weekend, <laughs> um, which I'm sure some people are going to have a heart attack over that. But um, I'm excited about it. It's a two-person tent. It's a trekking pole tent, so it's real lightweight, uh, and it's supposed to be able to handle gale force winds. So we'll see, because I know where I'm going, uh, they, it is a notorious place for high winds. I've been there before, and it definitely uh, will live up to that possibly this weekend. Also, because it's going to be in the 20s overnight, I'm taking my Outdoor Vitals little down booties with me as well, because I want to keep those feet warm when it's getting cold at night. Jeremiah, what kind of gear do you love from Outdoor Vitals? Well, I was going to show one piece here, if I can. Uh, Outdoor Vitals sent me their Nova Pro jacket. This right, dude, I got a feeling we have had such a mild winter so far. We're about to get smacked in the face. I think you're right. And, I think you're right. Oh, every cold day I've been wearing this just around, just around town. And I'll tell you one of my favorite features about it for backpacking. This is their warm jacket. But if you get too hot, it has pit zips, which I've never seen on a puffy insulated jacket before. So I thought that's super awesome. But that's the uh, Outdoor Vitals gear that I'm rocking at the moment. And I'll tell you what, we're so thankful to Outdoor Vitals for sponsoring this episode. They've been huge fans of the podcast. And uh, thanks again for sponsoring this one, Outdoor Vitals. Live ultra light. We're getting some funny comments already about the tent. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it you got to see this. This is funny. Um, where are we at here? Jeff Peters, tent. And then uh, we've got Miyagi, who's also on here. And he said, uh, what is this tent you speak of? So <laughs> He's a hammock exclusive guy. Almost. Now, I did hot tent with Miyagi on the trail. That's kind of luxurious, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, um, it's one of those things where uh, for, for, for me, I've always done the hammock. But... Uh, I have a YouTube channel, man. Got to do some tents every once in a while, right? Mm, most people, I think, use tents. Yeah. I think our guest today uses a tent. 
I believe so. As a matter of fact, we should probably start talking to that guest instead of talking to each other because I think that's why everybody's <laughs> here in the first place, right? <laughs> let's do it so let's bring on our guest uh you guys have heard of him he goes without saying welcome to the show andrew skirka what's going on man what's going on guys i was wondering if you were gonna do the uh jimmy kimmel matt damon thing to me where you talk and talk and talk and then like the final 30 <laughs> seconds of the show you bring on matt damon <laughs> <laughs> but... i actually like you though so i don't, I don't want to do that to you you know we'll actually let you be on here do you, um, Jeremiah, do you want to have a uh, contest to see whose feet are prettier? Oh, you want to, you want to put some feet on camera? We better give a trigger warning. No, no? <laughs> it would be a not suitable for work. Yeah. What happened to your feet? Oh, I I I pulled off a toenail this morning. Um, oh. It's like the second one in a week. Pulled yeah. off a toenail? I mean, well, you know, if they get if they um. If you get a blister underneath the toenail, which is pretty common just from if you're running a lot, oh. eventually you lose that toenail. So, yeah, I've never done that before, but you're pretty hardcore. Really? Man. You run marathons. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I run a lot. Run a lot. Yeah. 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 It didn't have in, um, in De early December. I, my feet are like finally like recovering from in early December. I tried to run a um, 100 mile track race and they're oh, wow. finally, finally recovering from that. It didn't go that well. I don't really want to talk about it, but um, they're <laughs> recovering. That's why I, that's why I, my toenails are missing. Well, actually that was the only reason we brought you on here was to talk about that 100 mile race. So shows over earliest show and <laughs> Shortest show in ever backpacker backpacker <laughs> podcast history. Uh, John, um, I know that somebody reached out to you, and that <laughs> with him talking about the hundred mile race made me think of this person that uh, told you to say hello. Oh yeah, and there was a there was a. Pass that along. I don't want you to forget. That's yeah, why I'm telling you. Yeah, there's a certain backpacker named Jeff Garmeyer that said to say hello to you. He is always on. He was like on the he was watching the hundred mile race too. Of my on the live stream. Are you really? When does this guy get an opportunity to train? Because he must be doing something right. Because he set that new JMT record this summer, beating string beans. So at some point he must be running. But he seems pretty. He's definitely following along. What's going on? <laughs> he's a, well, he's a big King, friend man. of the show for sure. He's been on multiple times, and he's a he's a lot of fun. He, remember it was. God, it was months ago now. I like spit my coffee out one morning. He was on his Instagram feed. He was he'd entered like a like a like a fun run five k up there in yeah. Montana, and he dressed up in a um a bathrobe and a woman's wig, <laughs> and um had a baby crib, and was like race like pushing this thing in the five k as fast as he could possibly go. So like you know he's able to like maintain a pretty good clip. So he's like just hauling ass in this baby crib or this like carriage like a baby carriage on this golf course for a fun run man he's not i wish, I had, he did, he's I, wish I had that did, sense of humor yeah he's the one that did an entire marathon in uh what kind of shoes was crocs. he wearing he's wearing crocs wasn't he yeah. was it a marathon he did a marathon in crocs something like so, that or yeah. half marathon or something it was it was crazy yeah i think yeah, i think he did a, a 10k at least yeah how many yeah. what's a marathon 26, 26 miles, miles. Let me see. Hey, I think he'd done a 10 K, but I don't want to discredit him. I wouldn't put anything past him. He might've done a hundred miles in Crocs. I have no idea. <laughs> it's crazy. Let's just think. start. Let's start making up stuff. I think he did like yeah. the entire Pacific crest trail in Crocs. Didn't he? Yeah. Well, I heard he did I the entire bad water. He did bad water in Crocs. Oh yeah. I heard he walked the entire, uh, great wall of China in Crocs and the entire great <laughs> Western loop. Yeah. The entire Western loop. It's the truth. And then he climbed up Mount Kilimanjaro in them. It was crazy. Hey, Crazy. Is when he this, summoned Everest, it really freaked me out. Can you uh, put outside comfort zones comment up there? I, is this an inside joke or something that uh, Skirka did that I don't know about? Yeah, I actually put this as one of the comments I was wondering about. Uh, can y'all ask Skirka if we can expect any turbulence or will tonight be a smooth flight? Skirka, any comment? I don't know no. what that means. Me either, Jared. What are you talking about, bro? You want? <laughs> we need more context. Yeah, we need some context here. I think we just we just made 
Andrew completely speechless with on that one. So <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to say. Yeah, look at uh, look at Devin's because this is something that I am really curious about. Uh, backcountry exposure. He he wants to hear about your guiding company and like for example, what's your favorite route to take clients on? Mm. And he says he loves seeing all the Escalante photos. Did I say that right? Escalante, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I don't. I could talk about the guiding company all night long. Um, so give be careful. So, um, so well, the, I got some questions for you about the guiding company. We we go there. So a uh, brief description is that we run um, we run three, five, seven, and eleven day long trips. Um, these are uh, we call it a guiding company, but I would say that the guides are as much like coach or instructor or facilitator where. We want our trips to be client-led, and they're um, designed to be educational and uh, trying to give clients the confidence and the know-how to do these trips on their own. We get a lot of repeats, too, who just find that it's a valuable service for us to secure all the permits and put together a great group and a great route and bring them the breakfast and dinners and make sure that they don't you know, get in trouble. But um, uh, the core mission is to the guy that is to is an educational one. And then uh, as far as the favorite routes, you know, schedule is, the schedule is sort of optimized for the season. So it starts in April um, down in Southern Utah in Escalante. So the Escalante, is, that's a, Escalante River is a tributary, of the Green, a tributary of the Colorado and it flows into Glen Powell or um, Lake Powell. And that's a, just a fantastic time for us to be there in April. There's no better place to be. Like the wildflowers are out, the cottonwoods are or like just have like that vibrant green to them temperatures daytime temperatures are like mild to cool, sometimes a little cool sometimes a little warm and then the nighttime temperatures are always usually pretty comfortable and then we transitioned um we're doing sand uh, great sand dunes in the beginning of june just as that will be greening up too we go up to alaska oh, wow. at the um, end of june beginning of july just between uh, the transition between like high water and like spring runoff and mosquitoes we do California in July, um, and then Olympics in the Olympic Peninsula in September. Finish the year out there on the East Coast in the in uh, West Virginia during peak fall peak fall foliage. Wow! Yeah. So it's so to say, like, what's your favorite one? I mean, they're all like, how could you argue with like you say, yeah, Utah in April or Alaska and at that time of the year? And oh yeah. Um, where do you go in the Appalachian Mountains? So we run our trips um, in West Virginia. We run the trips in West Virginia. We're in Monongahela National Forest. And um, we do uh, Seneca Creek and also Dolly Sods. Dolly Sods. Yeah, okay. That's some good yeah. spots. And do you go on every trip or do you basically have a team that kind of works I've out there a, with you? I've got a team now, yeah. So I'm I'm still on site with every location. Um, but it's just huh. you know, last year, we ran 60 trips last year. And um, I ran... I, <laughs> Hey, I, I guided, I guided, I guided twenty percent of them, and I was still okay. gone. I was gone ninety-seven days last year, which my wife included in our Christmas card. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it's great. not lost on her, like how much work is involved in this. Um, you know, but just it's just been necessity that as the program has gotten bigger, I can't guide every trip. Yeah, that. Thankfully, I've got you know, I've got a fantastic team. You know, if, if I'm not guiding the trip, then people are going out with some like, you know, flying Brian Robinson. who was the first guy to hike the calendar triple crown back in 2001 and a Barkley marathon finisher. Or they're going with uh, Joe McConaughey, who's um, you know, like famous, fastest known time guy. Um, Wait a second. Can you the, the first guy you just mentioned was a you said he was a Barkley finisher. Yeah. So Brian Robinson. <sighs> wow. Back in, back in 2001, hiked the calendar triple crown. I was still in college at the time. I mean, just like this was like the way back machine. He's been backpacking in the Sierra since the seventies. Wow. And then, yeah, he finished Barkley in 2000 and I think 2008, um, which was, I think he was like the 14th finisher at the time. Wow. That's amazing. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. The calendar thing is great, but man, I've heard, I know too much about the Barkleys. Nobody finishes that. <laughs> not too many people. I mean, the whole thing is designed to for you not to finish, right? Exactly. And it was his fourth. It was his fourth time, but like just, you know, and to Still, um, that's amazing. Yeah, and well, not even like I mean, you have to do it that many times often to finish it because mm -hmm. 
you have to understand the the route and where the loop and where the books are and um you have to learn how to manage yourself with that much sleep deprivation and, and pain so and suffering a lot a yeah. lot of suffering like the... <laughs> and, you, and you have to wait for like the right the right weather window too right so if it's if you get a year that's too hot you're probably just not like it's probably just not going to happen and similarly if it's too cold and wet it probably also isn't going to happen yeah well, we've got some comments going on up here. Like these guys are getting really funny out here. So uh, <laughs> we've got people talking about Garmire. Um, one person has told us that I heard he wrestled two grizzlies in Crocs. <laughs> um, and then let's see, we've got um, he did the forty-two peaks in New Balance four twenty nines. The are the four twenty nines? Is that the is that the geriatric New Balance? I think those are dad shoes. Those are my the, my dad wears those. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we finally figured out what the headset thing is or what they were talking about with you being a pilot, just making jokes ah, about the headset. And then Jeff's, okay. Jeff Peters made the statement that uh, he's got that smooth pilot voice with the headset. <laughs> and then uh, MK Ultra so, said, oh, wow, he does have a pilot voice. That rules. It goes further really? and says voice. he may have the smooth voice, but JS has the no blink eyes. <laughs> they, they're always saying I'm not blink. I'm blinking. Ah, whatever. And then finally, this is the one I thought was the biggest compliment of all, Andrew. They said, uh, I want him to narrate my life. So I have never been described as having a radio voice. I mean, I guess it's different than being a pilot voice, but. Um, well, apparently people I, I want you to narrate their entire life. So you must have I guess some I should go back voice. to school and earn my commercial pilot license. There you go, man. Yeah. There it is. Um, I have to so, warn everyone that in like probably. Within the next 60 seconds, I have a 17 pound cat who's about to jump uh -oh. onto my desk. So, as soon, as soon as you see this big tail and fur, <laughs> that's him. That's okay. And he's probably then going to come and scratch on my monitor because he's like, You spend too much time looking at this and you need to give me attention. My daughter well, did the same thing the other day and was actually on our podcast. So, totally get so it. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Totally I was going to ask uh, just out. Of, I don't think your house is haunted, but I noticed your door open. And then well, that's what happened. Like, he yeah, he came in. So yeah, this is our new our new kitty. He's his name is Luxor, um, which you would think oh like the casino, but in fact the casino is named after the the uh, the, the um, temple of Luxor or the Luxor temple in Egypt. And it was pretty arbitrary. My uh, wife and I thought he just kind of looked Egyptian. He's got this like beautiful. He's a he's a um, tabby cat. He's got these beautiful oh, yeah. eyeliner. Beautiful eyeliner. So. So you else? go ahead. Do you guys want to meet my cat? Yeah. Yes. We want to see your cat. This is what happens when you, when you don't have kids. Right, let's see. Come let's see you. Luxor. Come here, you. All right. Look at how big this guy oh, is. Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. That is a healthy cat. Yep. yep. He's <laughs> 17 put, pounds. He weighs 17 pounds. He's put. Yeah, he's. Yeah. But he's daddy's boy. Well, I got to say, I am partial to dogs, but your cat looks so precious. I don't hate them. I, ju I guess I just like dogs more. I get it. I get it. Yeah, we're we're a house cat, or we're a, we're a cat house, so. Well, we just got a warning that the uh, cat better not make the plane crash. <laughs> so. <laughs> get in the way of the controls. <laughs> so we were talking about your uh, your team, and I was curious – these people that you have working on the team, it, it, for any of them, is that their full-time job or do no. they kind of do that on the side? Yeah, it's, uh, there's a mix. So not for no one, is it a full-time job? Cause it's just, it's too seasonal. Right. And like, yeah. And, and at the most, um, I'd have to look it up to see like who guided the most last year, but I'm guessing, um, you know, to spend like 50 or 60 days in the field, that'd be probably a lot for the size of our program. Like we don't, we, we're not, we're not running so many trips where you could just like spend the whole summer guiding. Mm, um, I see. Uh, so for some of the guides, it's kind of, this is part of a portfolio of work. So they might be guiding for other organizations too. Maybe they have their own. Uh, so take someone like, um, or they might have like their own little small business. So someone like Katie Gerber, she runs a nutritional consulting company and, um, also does some online content and then someone like joe mcconaughey he's got does um ultra coaching or trail, trail running coaching so he's got kind of that going on so this is part of 
part of that portfolio. And then for a few other guides too, they're either retired or they might have full-time work. Um, I got so they you. kind of squeeze it in, squeeze it in when they can. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a great team. I wish they all lived closer because I would like hang out with them all the time. Um, whenever we get together, it's a lot of fun. I think that comes through on the trips too. I got one other question on the team. I know John's want to talk about gear tonight too, because uh, I went back and we had some awesome, funny stories and from the last episode that you were on. I, it was in the 40s, I think episode 42 maybe. Yep. But people can go back and listen to that. Uh, but we didn't talk a whole lot about gear, and we were very curious about what you take. But before we talk about it, uh, I was wondering if any of the trips, have you had uh, have you had your team have to come off trail or anything go astray? or like have to cancel a trip due to weather? Cause I assume that people like they'll apply and I don't know what the prerequisites are, but they go on your website and they apply for a trip. And let's say that I am accepted and we're supposed to start in April, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm supposed to fly in. Then all of a sudden, you know, Utah, that's not going to be very friendly to the dates that we picked. What do you do? Anything like that ever happened to you? Yeah. At this point we've seen it all. Um, so we, We've had some trips that have been canceled because of smoke, um, because of uh, so like wildfire issues. Most never at risk of like a like a fire, but more the smoke, just the air mm -hmm. quality. So we had some, um, you know, we had quite a few cancellations at the end of 2020 in California. We were supposed to be operating in Yosemite, and the Creek Fire, which ended up being like 350,000 acres just to the south, just was like just pouring smoke into um, into the park. Thanks. The night the night before we canceled the trips, we were in Mammoth Lakes, and uh, the AQI hit 1300, <laughs> which is like, if anyone follows the like, there's been like a um, a lot of people understand AQI nowadays because especially in the West because it's something that we deal with every summer. So yeah, it was 1300 in Mammoth Lakes, which is like, um, I think the number that's like unhealthy for all groups is 150 or or maybe 200. So it's something like wow. multiples more than unhealthy for all oh, groups. Wow. So we had some cancellations because of wildfire. Um, we've never had a cancellation related to weather. Um, we had some cancellations also. I had to cancel um, our Alaska trips in 2020 because of COVID. Um, the state just didn't open up in time for us to run our trips there. Mm. Um, and uh, we, in cases like that where we have to cancel, um, we either, we've got a few op options and they get to kind of pick. We can we can reschedule the trip if if possible, um, we can um, give them a voucher equal to the payments for a future trip or try to get them on a trip later in the season. Or if they just want to pull out, then there'll be like an administrative fee for all the process, all the sort of planning and preparation that goes into the trip. And then we refund them the rest. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the, uh, we've also had the other situation where people cancel, which is never great. It's sort of a lose-lose for both situations. And like, um, Inevitably, the like people fall off their bicycles and they break collarbones. Um, people have, uh, they're like some family member announces that they're getting married when they're supposed to be out with us. Um, wow. People ch people change jobs. They you know family like someone's spouse or someone's parent become you know gets ill or you know, sometimes a child. Um, uh, there are all what sorts of reasons are... why people cancel. Yeah. What if they're already on the trail? What if you're two days in on? Oh, and they need to, <laughs> they need to bail. Yeah. Um, I not just no, not need to bail. They but want to. They want to. Like I'm mentally, I'm out. That ever happened to you? It happened once last summer um, in San It was thankfully only a three day trip. We weren't that far out from the trailhead, and we were able to. One of the guides walked them out. Mm, wow. but that's pretty rare. That. It's pretty rare that someone is like, this is actually the one I thought it was going to be, and I'm not having a good time. I'm out of here. I was going to say, I think just... if, if I was going on a trip with you, I don't think that that would even be like something I would entertain. Yeah, I think people, um, my understanding, and I try to put myself in the client's perspective, but my understanding is that when people sign up for one of our trips, it's pretty clear to them that they're getting that they're getting a different experience than what like most other commercial organizations would offer. Like, it's very clear that like, we don't do tours. Um, and it's also very clear that um, our guides don't do everything for them. 
Um, there's, it's also clear there's an expectation that they will um, participate in a planning curriculum beforehand to make sure that they've got all the right gear and all the right food before we get to the trailhead. And, and you know, usually part of that planning process to the planning curriculum, it's sort of a little bit of a vetting tool where if someone gets into it and they're like, this is way more than I want to do. It's like, it's probably best actually at that point that we split because mm -hmm. they're probably looking for a different experience than what we provide. Yeah. We've actually got a question about your trips. Uh, Becky C was wondering, uh, do participants on your trips bring their own food? So we have the clients bring their um, daytime lunches and snacks, and then we supply the breakfast and dinners. Okay. And we find that's a great sort of a great way to do it because preparing breakfast or lunches and snacks is pretty easy, um, and it gives people control over what they want to eat during the day. And then we do breakfast and dinners because breakfast and dinners are kind of a pain to assemble beforehand so i think if we didn't that half the group would show up with like ramen noodles and the other half would show up with mountain house and no one would be that satisfied compared to what we actually make them that makes total sense that makes total sense okay get a few quick comments before we get on to what what i i, I gotta find out about today jeremiah so um but first we've got um one person who said the pizza ninja just said uh jeremiah you need to go all in on poop merch just saying <laughs> so yeah it needs to happen good the first shirt, I poop in the woods. Yeah, I think that that's where you need to go with this. Uh, and then uh, somebody else wanted to just say real quick, I'm going to calculate Jeremiah's blinks per minute so I can defend him against the haters. Oh, so, thank you. There are some people that have your back on here. Also, uh, Celestial Hikes just said, hey, I found your podcast after Thanksgiving. You've listened to almost every episode. I have about 20 left. That's a lot since November. Wow. That's 126 episodes. I don't know how they're not tired of listening it's to me. A lot well, of I would time. be so tired of hearing about us. And then another question um, having to do with cats. Uh, would a laser light work for a mountain lion like a house cat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that. <laughs> Could you imagine a, a mountain lion comes out and you just go pop and you're just like holding this laser light and you're – Shine it all over the place. Right. Shine it over across the slick rock. <laughs> see if you can get him to do some. Get him to jump off. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that's too. hilarious. Yeah. Um, okay. Now there's something that you and I have emailed about that, that I kind of would like to hear about, about you. And I think there's a lot of our listeners and viewers would like to hear this too. And that's what is your big three when you go backpacking your sleep system pack and mm. shelter system? What is it that you take typically? when you go out on trail. Yeah, we can go, we can go more than just big three too. So let me just give a little bit of context. So um, I, uh, I, I backpack in a lot of different seasons and environments. And I, so I just kind of like a kit that works um, and I don't want to have to like be swapping a bunch of things in and out, depending on where I'm going. Um, so right now or actually not even just right now but like the last season or two for a backpack i've been primarily using the seek outside flight two which i think is a great pack outside of not being able to fit a bear canister real well um, bear can needs to go in vertically which i don't love yeah. but for all other locations it works great and i can get away with it in california with a bear can so that's the backpack um how many the liters is that? Uh, how big is it? Yeah, how many liters is that one? Um, probably 55, 50, 55, 55 okay. maybe 60. Yeah, it's for me, It's I find it to be the right size for five to seven days. It carries weight really well. It's got all the features that you would want to have, like nice hip belt pockets, nice side pockets. It's durable. I, I looked it up. It's 2.4 pounds, 61 liters. Comfortably okay. carries 35 to 50 pounds. Oh, wow. That's a quality pack. I don't it know is. why anyone ever says that a pack can comfortably carry 50 pounds. If you ever carried 50 pounds, it is not comfortable. It's never comfortable. It is I not did it on my last trip. It was awful. I only had to <laughs> hop in like a mile and a half. Yeah, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. And I'm not saying like... I mean like a real 50 pounds, like you're at the trailhead and you've got a luggage scale and you weigh it and you're like, this thing weighs 50 pounds. I feel yeah. like, you know, like you hear people talking about 50 pounds and you're like, are you sure it was 50 pounds? 
Well, mine was 48.7, so I'll That's take that. Close. But it's yep, pretty, yep. Yeah, it's pretty close. I'll say yeah. I got on the Foothills Trail, and I think I was carrying 36 pounds. And I thought Still that was heavy. terrible. It's heavy. 36 so, is heavy. That, yeah. yeah, that definitely, you, you feel that. Yeah, you yeah. can't do as much. We find, you know, it depends a little bit on the person, but um, I would say pack weight over about 25 pounds for most people and you're seeing a decrease in agility and um uh like mileage walking speed etc it's like as soon as you as soon as you that's kind of the threshold 25 pounds you start what's that 25 pounds i i think about 25 pounds like like if i if i'm leaving the trailhead with a group and most clients are carrying 25 pounds i'm going to be really careful about passes that we go over and the off trail that we do until their packs are a little bit lighter mm. you know like the things that you can do at the end of a seven day trip when their packs are more like high teens or like mid teens yeah. pretty significant yeah. absolutely and uh there's a lot of people commenting on this actually right now um uh my goldfish drown which is a great name uh <laughs> back in the day 50 was nothing um James Hop Hooper says, I've carried as much as 70 pounds, but not comfortably. Uh, Girl Plus Dog Adventures said, uh, she's carried 55 pounds comfortably. I'm curious about that. Seven liters of water and five days of food for her dog and her. And Steve Wright said, he's old and 50 mm. pounds used to be light. He's not yeah. wrong. Yeah. yeah. But I guess back in the day, everything was heavy, right? Yeah. Oh, I can only begin to tell you. Yeah. I mean, I feel like an old timer nowadays. So I'm 40, 41 and I've been doing this. My, I did the Appalachian trail in 2002. So 21 years ago. And yeah, the scene just was totally different. I mean, like backpacking was an extension of mountaineering and I started off carrying a mountain Smith frost fire 4,500, which weighed seven and a half pounds empty. And I had a, an MSR whisper light stove and a, um, it was an MSR, what was the, a, maybe a gravity works filter. Oh yeah. It sounds like it's a ceramic filter. We, you know, we had Nalgene bottles and like, there wasn't, there just wasn't the, there wasn't the information available to like, to lighten up your pack in a, in a sound way. Um, there was like some things on the fringe, but it was like, you know, Ray Jardine saying that you should wear spandex shorts and have a backpack without a hip belt. I mean, like you can't even, if if you're starting off from a Mountain Smith Frostfire 4,500 that weighs seven and a half pounds empty, you can't even imagine going to a pack that weighs less than 16 ounces. So yeah. without a frame, you know, so just kind of not, not really practical. And then. So in addition to there not being that much information, there also just wasn't the gear. Right? Like the gear that we have nowadays is so good. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. I, you know, there, are, there probably are like 10 or 15 packs that I could use and be pretty happy with. Yeah, I think I think right now it's just amazing. Like when, especially the new fabrics that are coming out when you've got like the ultra fabrics and the Dyneema and X-Pack and all these different things that are coming out right now. Uh, Anybody can get a, a backpack that's two pounds or lighter at this point. Yeah. Uh, his is 2.4, and it seems to be doing fine. Yeah. I think with a, I think with a frame, you're always going to end up being more in that, you know, probably closer to, yeah, two somewhere between, two say, two and a quarter plus minus a quarter. It's probably yep. kind of the, the lower bound of that. Uh, all right. So that was backpack. So shelter, I've gone back to the Mountain Laurel Design Solo Mid XL. Okay. This is a shelter that I first used in 2010 on my big Alaska trip. And I came back to it because I, I spent years sort of away from it and worked like I designed my own shelter with Sear Designs. I used Seek Outside Silex. Um, I've set up probably at this point like hundreds of Z packs and Gossamer gears and HMG shelters. And I've used Tarp and Bivy and like I just kind of have seen it all. <laughs> And oh everything. my god! Oh my god! The number of X mids that I see nowadays too. <laughs> so, <laughs> many X -mids. so many X mids. So many X mids. If Dan is listening, Dan, next time you put in an order, please 
extend the corner guy lines so that they're not like three inches long. They need to be like three feet long to make them actually usable. So did he ever guide a trip for you? I know he was supposed to originally. He was supposed to in 2020. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And then he, we, we couldn't get him over the border for like a year and a half. And then by the time he was sort of available, he was busy with Durston gear and my program had grown quite a bit. And I had guides who were plenty capable of guiding in Alaska. They knew the program and also to, you know, Alaska for the guide team is sort of a, like, it's kind of, kind of a prize. So it's something, so it's an assignment say, that they all hope to get if they put in enough time for us. Would you say as far as relationships go, you just kind of outgrew each other? <laughs> is that, is that yeah. what happened here? Like, <laughs> Uh, sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I would, yeah, he's, yeah, I yeah. just didn't, uh, just the stars didn't align again. Well, I know that well, that X mid is massive right now. It is, especially the X mid pro it's anybody I've talked to who has one is just raving about that thing. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting note about the guidelines though. Yeah. So I went back to the solo mid because I just think for, for that weight, you're going to struggle to find a shelter that has that much storm resistance, that's that easy to set up, that has that much interior room, that's modular. I mean, you can get lighter, you can get more storm worthy. Um, you can get something with, uh, you know, but it just, as an overall package, it's pretty tough to beat. Do you use, so I looked it up because I didn't know what this tent looked like. And it's trekking pole tent, right? One trekking pole. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you uh, use the inner net part, like the the floor and the net and all that? Or do you typically take it without it? It depends on depends on where I am and what time of year. So. Okay. Well, give me the um, circumstances on your. Right. So if, I'm in, so if I'm in Alaska at like the end of June, beginning of July, I usually take the net because. That's when, around when we start to see mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in the Sierra or say I'm in like the, like the Olympics in September, I'm not bringing the net. I'll just bring a, I'll just bring a um, ground sheet, call it good. Okay. So bugs is the contribute the most contributing. Bugs would be the driver. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if, and if you're back East, so like last year I was in West Virginia and I'm, I brought the solo mid for that too. Um, I don't think I set it up. I, I set it up maybe one or two nights, but it, we had generally good weather, so I was able to just cowboy camp. But even in October in West Virginia, like there are a few little daddy long legs crawling around, but um, I like to cowboy camp when I can. I think it's more fun. What about the snakes whenever you're cowboy camping? That is, that's always the first thing that someone mentions to me. So bears. tell me, yeah, snakes or bears? I think it's one of those unfounded fears. I think, I mean, how many? Like spent like I don't know a thousand nights, fifteen hundred nights. I've never actually counted up, but like some like exorbitant number of nights. And then I know a lot of people have also spent hundreds or maybe thousands of nights, and no one has ever said to me, "I used to cowboy camp, and then a rattlesnake cuddled up with me one night, and I will never." Do. Like no one has ever <laughs> said that to me. It's a kind of the same thing with you know bears and hanging your food, where I think it's pretty rare to find someone. I said rare because I don't want your listeners to like misinterpret what I'm saying. Rare to find someone who slept with their food and had a bear come into their tent or like try to grab it from them in the middle of the night. Yeah, I like, gotta admit, yeah. I've slept many nights with food in my tent. Yeah, that's and... sort of like the it's sort of like the undiscussed secret among through hikers, right? Yeah. They're yeah. like, yeah, like, yeah. And yeah, I'm not delay. necessarily it's not it's not a practice that I would recommend in all places. Um it's not mm -hmm. something it's like in fact, like in some places it's downright dangerous, but there are plenty of instances where it's okay. And um, an educated backpacker needs to, you know, would be able to figure out when it's appropriate and when it's not. Yeah. I was going to say here in the Red River Gorge, don't even worry about it. Just sleep with your bag. You, there's not going to be any bears bothering you. But if you're in the Smoky Mountains, right, you yeah. better put that up on a bear cable. Like don't even think about putting it in your tent. Yeah. And similar story, like when we're in Dolly Sods, um, we're in Dolly Sods, we tend not to worry too much about the um, hanging food just because the, the bears there are hunted. They want nothing to do with humans. It's pretty rare. Like, I, we've never seen one. That's a great thing but about in, rednecks, man. 
That's the great thing about rednecks. <laughs> well, they hunt with dogs okay. too, which is even better. They hunt everything. Yeah. So yeah. animals are just kind of scared of uh, of rednecks. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the, the reason why bears aren't scared of people or are less scared of people in the uh, highly civilized areas of the world, so to speak, um, uh, uh, us good redneck areas where we live, they uh, they make sure those bears stay away. It's You're nice. not wrong. I mean, there there definitely is a correlation. I mean, we see it in Alaska too, in places where um. Places where bears see are like hunted by humans, we tend not to see bears. Um, in, in areas where humans kind of don't get to, like we have more issues with bears. Um, but you know, like so, dolly sods, no bear problems. But like, I would never sleep with my food in Yosemite. Oh. <laughs> Heck no. no. They have the little hooks whenever you're through hiking. Little hooks keep squirrels and mice from getting your food. You know what I'm talking about? In the shelters, it's got the can hanging mm -hmm. over it, string yeah, in. Right. Yep. 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 Every shelter, every person. Mm -hmm. Oh, this I is think. great. I get, you gotta, you gotta see this. Uh, MK yeah. Ultra said, I personally woke up next to someone who had a black snake cuddled up with her Ooh. bag. Oh my goodness. Um, and then my goldfish, snake. my goldfish drown says, I always sleep with my food in Colorado. And then quickly says, come at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Colorado, I would, in Colorado, I would say that's generally okay. Um, Rocky Mountain has a has a um, bear canister regulation that I would suggest complying with, but Colorado is not great bear habitat. So generally speaking, tends not to be great. There are some areas where they're they're they do better than other places, but yeah, we're... I have I've seen on the the AT like just section hiking it. Certain places I've seen people that like lost their whole like food resupply due to a bear. You know, it just yeah. once once it has a hold of that bag, then it just like even if you doesn't get all your food, it's still not edible. So then you could be like two days away from town, and you don't have any food, and you have to hike out. Yeah. Well, I was gonna so say some that... of your listeners would probably know this. What's the? I know that last year the, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy put out sort of like a like a bear canister advisory saying that we're, you know, we're nowadays recommending all hikers wear or use a bear canister on the Appalachian trail. Um, is that still the policy there? Because I just feel like it's inevitable that there will be a bear canister requirement on the Appalachian trail. I wouldn't be surprised because there's so much bear activity. It's so okay. much bear activity and people, and let's be honest, people are really bad at hanging food. Like yeah, how many yeah. times, how many times, have you been able to find the perfect tree? <laughs> Never. <laughs> and exist. then you, and then you walk away from your hang, and it's this perfect, you know, Mike Cleland graphic of it being ten feet off the ground and six feet away from the trunk and any other branch. Never. 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 And a well-trained bear, like, have you ever seen a bear climb a tree? It's, They're so good at oh, it. It's effortless. Right. I was actually yeah. talking to somebody about this last yeah. night. Um, my my family in Virginia, they all go bear hunting, and they train their dogs for it by chasing bears up trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how they, yeah. they train them to go bear hunting. And so, like, these bears can just go up a tree like it's nothing. Yeah. They're right. good climbers. Yeah, fantastic climbers. So any determined bear um, is going gonna, is gonna to figure out how to get someone's food if it's not hung properly. I mean, how, like, again, how many how many times have you seen a bear can that's or a bear hang that's you know, that would whack you in the head if you walked under it, or that is, you know, two feet away from the trunk. So people are just asking a bear to come and get their food. And then my, I just don't understand the conclusion too of someone saying, well, I, I always hang my food in it and I've never had a problem with it. It doesn't mean you did it right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, um, I had one, my favorite one so far was uh, a guy, there was like a little sapling tree and he hung his bear bag right by his campsite, like 10 feet from his tent. And it was maybe six, seven feet off the ground. And I remember thinking to myself, maybe it's a decoration, you know, because <laughs> at that, that point, I don't know that it's really doing anything other than it just looks like a nice little ornament hanging off to the side of your campsite. There is some value with that kind of hang, um, but you shouldn't call it bear hang. It's a rodent hang. So if you're just no, like that, yeah, that's been a lot of the comments we've been getting actually. Yeah, if you're just hanging it to get it away from like the mice and the squirrels and whatever else might be in the campsite, that's that's a very different conversation than than a bear hang. 
Yeah, you've got so many already people saying squirrels and mice are often more of a threat than bears when referring to food bags. Totally Um, correct. Yeah, rabbits and stuff are a nuisance. Um, Lots of bats and mice, or uh, ran into bats in shelters, and lots and lots of mice in the Adirondacks. Mm. So that's definitely that seems to be like more of an issue for a lot of people than the bears. Well, I tell you, on the bear canister situation, I'm not a big fan because I don't like adding the extra weight to like the gear that I'm already taking. But uh, I have seen people use them most often as like a stool, so you can just sit on it. Or I've seen people do laundry in it. Y'all ever seen that? It's a great camp yeah. chair and good for laundry too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what other use does it have besides those two and its practical use of? I haven't seen anything else. So I was just taking up there is, on my pack. there is one bear can that um, I'm not sure if it's still available. I think it's called the little Sammy. Um, the, the, the top is made out of metal and you can use it as a pan or like, like a pot, oh. but that's bad. You know, it's this wide. So I'm not sure it's, I actually want to be cooking on that. Yeah. Well, here's a I question bet- for you. Um, Ursacs. Someone mentioned they use an Ursac in high bear populations in Western PA. Um, what are your thoughts on the Ursac? I think the Ursac is a good is a good buyer of time. It's a it's something that I will use. It's something that I will use if I'm something that I'll use if I'm think that it's possible that I might have a bear issue and if um, the parks or like whatever the land agency is allowing me to do it. But I don't I don't. I think the track record of ursacs is that if a bear, if a, if a bear, if you give the bear enough time, it's probably going to rip the thing open. And even if it doesn't, your food is going to be like pulverized, and it's going to bear slobber all over it. <laughs> so that doesn't really. I don't think an ursac. An ursac is definitely not a good solution in areas where there are active bear problems. Um, I think it's a. I think it's a insurance. I think it's a good insurance option for areas where there are bears, but you haven't, you're not hearing of frequent um, bear human conflicts. Oh yeah. Now we've, we've talked about your, your shelter and we've talked about your pack. Let's get to your sleep system. I want to know what it is that you sleep on when you're out in the back country. So this might be like hearsay here, but um, so I am very close to just ditching quilts altogether. <laughs> So, I know. Look at your eyes. I think hey, Jeremiah. Man, that's just, great. I think Jeremiah just blinked. Even. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, because I've been like a long promoter of quilts, and I just—I'm not sure if it's me getting older, or if me having like me having like less body fat than I used to, or. But What's like, wrong with I just, quilts? They're drafty. They are drafty. They're they just drafty. too drafty. I am tired of and like t- drafty, and they don't insulate your head, so you're just mm-hmm. sort of always losing like this heat out or from around your neck, and you've got no insulation here. And um, I just, and then I think the other piece of it too. Twenty years ago, or maybe not even 20, fifteen years ago, there's a pretty significant weight difference between quilts and mummy bags. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the weight of a modern mummy. Like you're not saving a lot of weight by going to a quilt. How much weight are like, you saving? Two pounds? Pound oh, and a half? Well, oh, no, 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 no. Like, like two, ounce, two ounces. Two ounces? Maybe three ounces. It's the weight. No, it's I the weight it's of more. It's the weight of a number three or a number five zipper. Um, and um, and some fabric. On or, that you would be sleeping on versus a mummy. It just doesn't what add up to that much weight. Yeah, Devin from Backcountry Exposure says the same thing. I've completely yeah. ditched quilts, bags only now. And I'm going to be honest, uh, I use quilts in a hammock because they just make more sense in a hammock. Totally, totally, right. But That's in a tent, I'm going with a tent this weekend, and I'm bringing a sleeping bag. Yeah. So I also think there's there's like quilts have been extended into temperature ranges that I just don't think make any sense. So my rule of thumb is like I will not even consider a quilt if temperatures are going to be close to freezing or less. Like at that like at that point, like the amount of heat loss around your head is huge, mm-hmm. and you just and your parka, 
like your hooded park is just not enough to like it's not even close to what the hood of a mummy bag would be mm. um so sense. you know so to answer your specific question so for the last two seasons i've been using um i don't i don't I can't recall the model it's enlightened equipment and it's the one that's got the full zipper in the back and there has not been a single night where, where, I, where i have unzipped that damn thing so just like what i just need to do this season before the season starts is go over to westernmountaineering.com and buy myself a nice like summer light or alpine light and just be done with it i thought about that but then i realized i'd have to sell one of my children on the black market yeah dude, yeah. Was, yeah how is your stuff so expensive i bought yeah. one western mountaineering quilt and it's a 27 degree mm -hmm. and it was like 400 dollars mm -hmm. and i was like this is expensive but i guess i get yeah, it I it's, mean, it is more it's fabric the, it's more it's down the, it's the product i mean they're if you look at their stuff and like um if you go to REI, like, I mean, the products are good, but like you just, you pick up a Western product and this is the case with a few others too. Like enlightened equipment actually has this level of quality. They just don't make a mummy bag. Um, uh, but like, you know, that West, like those, when you're dealing with a high end down product, you just feel the difference. It's like the down the shell fabric, the perfect ratios of baffles to, to insulation. Mm. And the thing is like, you know, yeah, it's 400 something bucks. You'll never buy it again. And if you want to sell it, you could probably get 300 and change for it. That is true. It's going to hold its value. Yeah. And, and everybody, the technology is not, the technology is not, it's not like the technology is rapidly improving, right? It's not like you're buying a, it's not like you're buying a personal computer. Yeah. Or yeah. an iPhone. It's gonna, it'll stay about the same, mm -hmm. you know, they already got it figured out with the research and development on that product quick uh quick sleeping bag story so because we brought talked about him earlier so brian robinson on his 2001 trip used a um a feather friends hummingbird and he weighed it when it was brand new and then he used it for like 300 some odd nights on his calendar triple crown and then he used it like for like like a decade guiding with me and a bunch of other personal trips and um, he weighed it again and it had gained um it had gained like three ounces and the only conclusion that he could get to was that that was basically like, like body oil and dirt <laughs> in, in his sleeping bag. <laughs> That's so, so bad. Yeah. <laughs> What's the longest that you all have went without washing? You've repeatedly used, but not washed your sleeping bag or quilt. Um, I mean, definitely off, you know, a full through hike. So, you know, six months, seven months. And when you washed it, did it lose any of the, did you even notice the stain before recall. you washed it? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I don't think you'll ever, that through hiker stench, you'll never yeah. get that out of stuff. Like that is, that is in that product. I mean, yeah. short of like an ultraviolet light with like bleach. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think it ever is going to come out. That's funny how you say that. It it's funny you say that because I was I did the shell toy trace with a buddy of mine who did the AT, and he wore the shirt that he wore when he hiked the AT. Oh, he probably smelled just in the car. Within thirty minutes of the hike yeah. starting, <laughs> that thing smelled <laughs> so bad, and I could, I was hiking behind him and I was already smelling him, yeah, because of how bad it smelled just that quick. And he he yeah. goes, dude, I've tried to get everything out, to get the smell out of these these clothes, yeah, and just it just won't go it. away. It just needs to be thrown away and get something new. Um, yeah. Out of all the long trails, the Appalachian Trail is by far the smelliest trail. I mean, that is the, like, I bet you might be able to wear something or like use something on one of the drier trails, like the Pacific Crest or Consul Divide and like, and like use it again afterwards. Um, Cause you just have, it's drier. Um, you don't have quite the, like the buildup of bacteria and whatever else is contributing to that smell. And all the humidity. <laughs> It, Let me yeah, tell you, the stuff yeah, never crazy. dries. It never dries. Yeah. So I apologize if anybody's heard this before. I don't remember if I talked about it on here, but if I did, I'm sorry. But I'm going to tell Andrew because oh, you think probably did. So I did the Vermont Long Trail, and that took me about a month. And I had to dispose of the clothes after I got done with it. I don't know how long it takes to build up that stank, but it happens pretty quick. You know, if you're not showering for like a week straight, 
And I wore those same clothes every day on trail. And then I had a pair of like night clothes, you know, to wear around camp. And then once the trail was done, I'd met somebody on the trail that's part of our trail family. And his dad picked us up and took us back to Massachusetts so I could fly home the next day. And I spent the night at his house, but he lived with his parents. You know, he's like 19, 20 years old. And I was like, I don't know, 22, 23. So I got to the house and his mom wouldn't let me come inside the house. She, <laughs> she literally stopped me at the door and made me wait in the garage. And after Birdie got done taking his shower, then she let me come inside and uh, she was like, hey, you need to uh, get your clothes in a pile so I can wash them. And she said, I'll bring you some of Birdie's clothes. <laughs> yeah, look at the Jeff Peters. This one time with a log trail. <laughs> so she gave me uh, some of his clothes or his brother's clothes that would fit me while I waited on the shower. And I got my clothes in a pile and I was like, you're going to wash these? I was like, here you go. And she literally wouldn't take them. She said, follow me. Took me down to the basement. <laughs> the uh, washer and dryer made me throw them in there i thought that she was afraid to touch them even after they were washed but uh, that's i was that's wouldn't great. blame her so no, it's disgusting. when i did the appalachian trail in 2002 um like maybe just a year prior or maybe a couple of years prior um one of the dart there was a dormitory in dartmouth college that used to host appalachian trail hikers and they'd actually just just stopped like very recently, and the oh, primary man. reason for them stopping was that they couldn't like they couldn't endure the stench anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I totally I get understand. It. We, when we did when we did the Sheltoe Trace, we stayed at a friend's house, and he picks up, up us up in his car, and he just goes, "Oh my gosh!" and rolls all the windows down. And, and drives us to his house and his wife. We walked in and she was glad to see us. And she came up like she was going to hug us. And then she put her hands out and shook all of our hands. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was so which bad. Is, which is also maybe dangerous doing too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, so we didn't, we talked about your sleeping bag, but are you a pillow and not a pillow person? I've graduated to a pillow. Oh, okay, so what yes. pillow do you use? Your, years, of, years of sleeping on. Like my trash or my my wet shoes or um, whatever I could, whatever volume I could gather in my pack that wasn't in use when I slept, I, I kind of just got over that. In oh, fairness, though, cool. too, the um with the with the thickness of mattresses nowadays, you actually almost have to have a pillow because back in the day, where like a high end Thermarest ultralight self inflating pad was only one inch thick. So you didn't need a lot of you didn't need a lot of volume to kind of create a pillow. Nowadays you do. So I use a um, this the pillow I have. It's like a it's a um, Cedar Summit. It's got kind of like some like down pillow on one pillow. side, down on one side, kind of like a meshy like a f fleecy surface on the other. Yep. It's just the right, like pillows. You would think that like the larger pillow would be better, but I actually think that like a um, what is that probably like 12 by six or so it's probably about the right size enough to get your head on arrows arrows yeah. is that their brand is it pillow that pillow sounds, that sounds that right, sounds right. Yeah. yeah the Aris. Yeah. Aris? Yeah. is that it yeah and then the other the other thing i always try to do i always look for a campsite it looks like look for a sleeping area where the there's some natural landscaping to kind of like prop up my head a little bit more because i'm a i'm a back sleeper so if i can get like another couple inches just with some like a little a little lift mm -hmm. and then even better is if there's like a little divot for my butt and then a and then a rise for the back of my knees now how often do you find a spot like that i'm really good at finding spots he's andrew skirka jeremy jeremiah just whatever because, your name is because whatever i don't your name like, is he's andrew i don't like skirka, to set up dude. my shelter so i don't like to set up my shelter so i will like i'll just squirm into places where no one would ever think about sleeping like under you know underneath like a white bark pine or a, you know or like or like under a bush or something just like you know where other people haven't necessarily slept um if it's if that's appropriate to do i'm just still i'm just yeah. still like 
shocked that Jeremiah asked Andrew Skirka, "How do you? Are you sure you can find those campsites?" Come no, on, that dude. is not what. what that was, is not what. What I is did. that, dude? What is that? I'm, out of pure curiosity, <laughs> I was wondering how often he could find it. But he is Osprey, uh, apparently at an expert level on seeking out these places. He spent some. Th- I mean, how many nights have you spent out on trail? A lot. A thou- yeah, thousands. Thousands, plus. right? Yeah. yeah. So the one thing I the one thing I always tell people is like is like, look, you're gonna spend you're gonna spend like eight hours laying here. Mm-hmm. Spend you know five minutes picking your spot. Yep. But I just see it often where someone comes in. It's been a long day, and they just look at a spot and they're like, "Like my tent would fit here." Period. And they just that's where they're gonna lay. And then they're on an angle and they're sliding all a, night. And there's a rock in their back. Yeah, yep. sure. Yeah. Okay, so we're at the point in the in the show where we have to. There's something we have to talk about. It's been brought up throughout the chat, and I think we talked to you about this last time. You told us a really good grizzly bear story about this, um, where you actually scared the poop out of a bear. But do you have any really good poop stories from the trail that you would be willing to share on here with our listeners? Can I share my screen? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. So. I think so. Do you have the button that says share screen? Because if so. Okay, all right, here we go. Yeah, okay, hold on. I think on. John can hook you up. So I'm going to share my screen. He's um, our show so, producer. So this summer, I was in September. I was in, oh my God, all my cat photos. Um, I was, <laughs> I'll pull it off until you, until you uh... <laughs> oh, Actually, since we're on it here. So this is, we had neighbor with, or dinner the other night with one of my, one of my 80s, like 79 year old neighbors. This is his stove. It's a wow, frigid air. Wow. It's a frigid air. Um, what's it That's called? an original. That's wild. It's totally original. Frigid air, custom imperial. And, and he's, I just, it's a, it's a time capsule. So that was, but anyway, let's get back to the reason I was, so <laughs> let's see. <laughs> um, all right. So Washington was on, right. It was on this trip. So we're in Washington and we were camping up this area called thousand acre meadow. I think it's the first time anybody's sh- ever done a slideshow sh- with a poop no. story. This isn't the, yeah, right this trip. Is it's the, it's the week, be- it's the week before. Oh, okay. And this, this thousand eight, this area is just, it's f- covered in huckleberries. So we pulled up to this area and we saw three bears grazing these huckleberries. And um, I was trying to find, it's like, here's, an, here's what it looks like. And I was trying, normally I would like go like try to camp underneath one of these spruce trees. So that's what I was trying to do. And any time that I got underneath one of these spruce trees, I would find these huge piles of bear shit. <laughs> that's that's bear poop. Oh my so, gosh. I've never seen so much bear poop in my life. So there it is. There it is. That's I've so never disappoint, I guess, with poop stories. <laughs> never. Never ever. So um let's get let's get everybody back on here now. Uh so and then we gotta pull that one off. There we go. Okay, so just uh out of curiosity, just out of morbid curiosity, um, have you ever accidentally set up or stepped in it as you're setting up for your campsite? I think um many years ago. I was on the long trail and I think I might have um might have camped in someone's poop. Really? Oh, camped on top of it in your tent, yeah. like set it up yeah. on top. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, what were the uh clues that led you to believe that you might have <laughs> Well, what what do you think might give it away? There might have been a <laughs> smell. There, the might, smell there, might have, there might have been a smell and there might have been something that it's a substance that didn't quite have the consistency of mud. Oh, oh I'm so yeah. sorry. Oh man. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those like you know, looking back at it, it's one of the things I always tell people when we're teaching when we're like giving a tutorial on how to poop in the woods. Um I always say like don't don't poop where someone else could possibly camp, take a break, or even poop. Like you want to find that inconspicuous spot that just no one else would think about doing anything there that random spot in the woods. And this person didn't heed that advice. They just pooped right off the trail. 
I found out the hard way. So. Oh, that that's awful. Great. That's awful. You win. Bro, you win. That's gross. <laughs> yeah. You win. I right. had, I had, I haven't. I think I've ever told that story. That's good, guys. Oh, backpacking <laughs> podcast exclusive. We, we call that a backpacking podcast exclusive. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, we're wrapping up the show here. We want to give you the chance to uh, tell everybody. I know you got your website, andrewskirka.com. Tell everybody uh, where they can follow you, where they can look up information if they're interested in going on one of your guided uh, trips or your Instagram, all that stuff. Where can they find you? Um, that website would be the right place to start. So every, everything, yeah, you can find info on the trips there. Um, I think I, I, I'm certain that I have so, the social media links off that site. And for anyone who's interested in maybe joining a trip this year, registrations are now open. Um, right now we have, um, we still have some openings in Utah and some in Colorado. Um, Alaska is totally sold out and like at wait lists. Um, California trips, hit or miss depending on the length. And Washington, probably about the same. Well, people definitely need to give you a follow on Instagram. I love seeing your your pictures of your trips. And also, you got some delicious food on there, man. I know. I've seen avocados on trail. Oh, you like the lunches? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I definitely get some food jealousy going on when I when I look at your pictures. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, for sure. well Dude, I'll tell you guys next time. I, I put up my lunch. Yeah. yeah well, it is do. a do. huge pleasure having you back on here, dude. It's, it's always fun time talking to you. And I don't know. I feel like I'm talking to, like, I don't know what my backpacking, if you could put a number on how smart I am at backpacking, but I feel like you're off the charts and I'm like way down here in the basement, like trying to climb onto the first floor. You're just like a guru, dude. I, I feel like Thank we're taking a college level class on backpacking when you're on. Yeah, it. that's kind of that's kind of what it feels like to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, I, I wanted to say this before you got off of here. The last time you were on, you were talking about teaching people how to use a compass and a map. And yeah. I had mentioned that at some point I need to learn how to do that. And I just got this recently. So um, this weekend. Oh, look at that. All right. Little Sunto M. What is it called? An MC2. It looks like. Yep. And uh, I've got a buddy who's a former Marine. We're going out backpacking this weekend, and he we're going to use that this weekend. He's going to show me how to use that uh, when I'm out in the backcountry. So that was that was inspired by our conversation like two years ago. Two years it later. By, <laughs> it was so <laughs> inspiring. <laughs> two years later, I finally bought a couple. Well, I've never been known to be <laughs> like on, quick well, on the draw, a, man. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a slow mover. Well, you need two things to use a, to, for comp, map and compass. So you've got your compass. Do you have a paper map of where you're going to? I have topo maps, yes. Okay. So he's, oh, he's, he's, go, he's, then. he's oh, been explaining yeah. all the stuff to me, how it works. Okay. And I'm like, all right, let's go. All right. So we'll see how it goes. If I could say, so I think on the on the navigation thing, we should all be like, we like to be a you know, kind of an all of the above um, program for the tools that we use. So we think it's super important to learn how to read a map, like read a paper map. And we think it's really important to use to know how to use compass and an altimeter and a timepiece so that you can dead reckon. And then we also think like the phone is just such a such a huge, powerful tool. Um, but it's if you know all the tools, like they all kind of have different pros and cons and like there's a different optimal application for, e for each one. So you might find, um, John, that you're using the compass a lot more often in some situations than in the past. Yeah, I'm interested to see how it goes and we'll find out just how uh, low I am on the backpacking brain scale when we get out there and use this thing. You guys so. are probably sandbagging yourselves. But listen, it's been a hoot to uh, to be on the program. You guys are you guys always crack me up, so it's fun to be on with you. <laughs> well, well we look forward to comments. hopefully having you on again maybe in another year or two. If Hopefully you'll have no us. more no pandemics between between now and then. Yes, so. we want to avoid those. Okay, good night, guys. <laughs> All right, we'll talk right. to you later. Yeah, thank you so much, man. It's always great having him on the show, man. It is I'm always great having him on the show. There's just a, it's just a <laughs> whole, <laughs> it's just a whole different level, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude, you described it perfectly on the uh, like a college course. He he can answer all my questions. Like there's nothing I could throw at him that he hasn't seen. Well, the very first 
it's funny that we asked him a poop question because the very first video I ever saw of Andrew Skirka was him explaining how to use rocks and stones and leaves and debris to clean your backside when you go backpacking. Yeah, that sounds terrible. That's one of the first videos <laughs> that I ever that I ever saw of his was a an instruction on how to dig a cat hole and, and, and how to clean yourself up using natural means. So uh, it's funny that we asked him that question. So that video was like years old. I don't know what it was on, but I, I remember watching it and I was like, who is this guy? And then I did some research. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So that's who this guy is. So uh, yeah, I, can't, I can't believe we've gotten to talk to him twice. I know, man. I know. We're, we're leveling up today. We're leveling up. Knowledge too. Hope somebody else learned something too. I, I know. I know. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast tonight and the live stream. And, and for myself and Jeremiah, we will catch you all on the next one. Yeah. Adios, folks. Yeah.